Kuzampur, you're watching Bhutan this week and I'm Tenzin Rapki. In this week's top stories, His Majesty the King granted audiences to the Joint Secretary North of the Ministry of External Affairs of India, Aklish Mishra, the Ambassador of the United States to India, Nancy J. Powell, and the British High Commissioner to India, Sir James Bhavan, this week. Gelifu Airport, the country's third domestic airport, has been launched. And the water level of the Thorthomi Lake in Lunana has been successfully lowered by the set target of 5 meters. His Majesty the King granted an audience to the Joint Secretary North of the Ministry of External Affairs of India, Aklish Mishra, and the Ambassador of the United States to India, Nancy J. Powell, on Tuesday. His Majesty the King granted audience to the U.S. Ambassador to India, Nancy J. Paul. Ambassador Paul is in the country on a six-day official visit. She arrived on Sunday leading a four-member delegation. She is the first woman U.S. Ambassador to India and holds the highest rank in the U.S. Foreign Service with the title of Career Ambassador. Prior to her current appointment, she was the Director General of the Foreign Service and the Director General of Human Resources. She has also served as the U.S. Ambassador to Nepal, Pakistan, Ghana and to Uganda. Later in the afternoon, His Majesty the King granted audience to the Joint Secretary North of the Ministry of External Affairs of India, Akhilesh Mishra. Joint Secretary Akhilesh Mishra is in the Kingdom on a five-day official visit. He arrived on Saturday. He joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1989 and assumed the current position in July last year. Prior to his current appointment, he served as the Joint Secretary of the Multilateral Economic Relations Division. Joint Secretary Akhilesh Mishra had held various positions in the Foreign Service, including the Deputy Chief of Mission at the Embassy of India in Kabul, Afghanistan. He had also served as the Deputy High Commissioner at the High Commission of India in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania and the Deputy Consul General of India in San Francisco. The Shinongmo, BBS News. And yesterday, His Majesty the King granted an audience to the British High Commissioner to India, Sir James Bivan. He arrived in the country on Tuesday. This is his first visit to Bhutan after assuming his current position last year. Sir James said his visit to Bhutan would further strengthen and deepen relations between Bhutan and the United Kingdom. Sir James called on the Minister in Charge for Foreign Affairs, Khandu Wanchu. Sir James said GNH is greatly supported by the British Royal Family and the British Prime Minister, David Cameron himself. The two discuss accelerating Bhutan's socio-economic growth, foreign direct investment, democracy and other issues of mutual interest. He also called on the President of the Bhutan National Legal Institute, Her Royal Highness Princess Sonam Dishin Wanchu. Gelifu Airport, Bhutan's third domestic airport, opened yesterday. It was inaugurated by the Prime Minister. The airport is located about 6 kilometers from Gelifu town. The flight time from Paro to Gelifu is about 25 minutes. As the Druk Air entered the Gelifu airspace, fingers pointed towards the sky, the crowd on the ground roared with excitement. <laughs> Thousands, including some from the neighboring Zonkaks, came to witness the historical event. As the ATR-42 touched the ground, a loud clapping sound echoed in the airport. Prime Minister Jigme Waitinle and the officials accompanying were received in the traditional Chibdral ceremony. <laughs> Following the marching ceremony, the Lhapsan Trisul or the purification ceremony of the airport was conducted in the presence of the Prime Minister. <laughs> Speaking to the people gathered, Nguyen said, Today is a day for all the Bhutanese to feel proud. <laughs> Gehabt 
te shizu bede ke bawda lo te deng a chale ke gya khabte na me samay ke ta kon fe lejim be yoni ke ta sanchi in ise shuni na yada jo ke ta sanchi in ise shuni the drug air has not worked out the flight schedule right now as the infrastructure are yet to be completed. It said the fare will come to about $170 as the distance between Paro to Bumtang and Paro to Kelifu is the same. The fare is for one way. The airport has been constructed on an area spanning over 500 acres. That shouldn't be BBS News, Kelifu. Obesity is a growing health problem worldwide, especially in the West. Though Bhutan does not have many obese people, it is becoming a concern. A study carried out in 2007 revealed obesity is on the rise in the country. The story you are about to watch is about a man who has gained too much body weight, so much so that it has restricted his movement. He has lived like this for the past 10 years now. This is Pup Doji, 27 years old from Shia Kashi in Wangdi Fodrong and he can barely move. He has been like this for a decade now. <laughs> Health workers assume that he would weigh about 150 kilograms. From 2003, Pukdoji has not been able to visit hospital for a proper medical care. Pukdoji didn't have all the luxury to eat well and do nothing, but had some complication on his leg by birth. He injured his foot at the age of nine. He visited various hospitals in the country, but to no avail. Pupdoji lives with his mother and sister. I wish and pray for my son's death before mine. His sister also cares for him. For instance, when we're alone at home and if he falls sick, then at least I could shout for help and call the neighbors. But if anything happens with me, then it would be difficult for him to seek any help or assistance as he can't move around. These are some of the troubled thoughts that run deep through my mind. The problem is far from over. Pup Doji doesn't have an identity card. Owing to his overweight, he was not able to take picture for processing identity card. There is no one to help in the village. Even when I need to go somewhere else, there isn't anyone to give him company. There are a few people who are unemployed, and even if I seek any help, they won't come. So I make sure that I come back in the evening, but before leaving, I need to pack his food and leave it somewhere near where he could reach. And also I cannot leave until his excretions are taken care of. But for Pup Doji, that one person he remains grateful for consistent help is His Royal Highness, Prince Namgil Wangchuk. I met His Royal Highness once and he was so kind enough of supporting me financially. Pup Doji wishes to lead a normal life, yet he knows that his wish is far from getting fulfilled. I wish and pray that in my next life, let all the sins and sufferings that I am spelled with be washed away and never to let these sufferings inflict me again. Despite all these odds staked against him, the 27-year-old is a fun-loving person. Kinga Wangmo for BBS News. Linji and Sedioks are mostly inhabited by nomads who migrate seasonally. The Gyoks have not seen much development over the years. The people are excited and all smiles these days. The reason behind the happiness is the promise made by the Prime Minister to construct a farm road from Shehana to Shinkarab. The Prime Minister in his recent visit to Se and Ninji Gyoks promised to construct a farm road from Shana to Shinkarab. Lynchin said the farm road construction would be carried out in the 11th five-year plan. <laughs> The 
Amina Sensuli did a lump dum doch bochin, Garigi lump dog of doch bochin, Namin Samaki Zeta bomb, Tangobchi Mindu. The Amos Sensuchi, then a chicken cade, Jojo Tenigi, the Pacham get Marala. The construction of a farm road from Shana to Shinkarab would shorten the distance by a day. Presently, Suigyok is officially three days' walk from the nearest route head, while Niji is four days' walk. The Samsab di Machabachin to Chimapalinalia, Tatulam Jumasubiasila, Palagil Capari Prachasila, Titi Adamalaku Jusumibe and Abula. Tiji nam sme pento yula, say, no shushu, nilam chi jusalu, chakaji jumongo, ni jusalu chi jumongo nam sme pemba yus. The journey to the two remote gyoks of Se and Niji gyoks are long and arduous and dangerous during monsoon when rivers along the way swell. However, people say developments that have taken place in the past couple of months had made their journey a little easier. Developments such as extension of mule tracks and construction of small bridges along the way have made travelling not only easy but shorter as well. About 14 bridges were constructed. The construction of these small bridges and the extension of mule tracks were carried out at a cost of 3 million neutrum. Kampal Fukazangtile, the Shinongmo, BBS News. The water level of the Tortomi Lake has been successfully lowered by the set target of 5 meters. The mitigation work at Tortomi Lake in Dunana was started in 2008 after studies revealed Tortomi Lake as one of the potential lakes posing threats downstream. The actual excavation works at the Thorthormi Lake began only in 2009. In this year's working season, which began in July, the lake was reduced by 1.32 meters. This year, due to manpower shortage, more than 100 Royal Bhutan Army personnel helped in the excavation works. The Director General of the Department of Geology and Mines expressed his gratitude to the workforce as the progress made this year at the site was tremendous despite the inhospitable working condition. Work is most of the time in the water. At that altitude, cold weather, working in the water is becoming extremely difficult. But because of the presence of the army this time, the effectiveness of the work has been really, uh, I must say, it's very amazing because the progress of the work was really good. The Director General also said, by reducing the water level, the risk of the glacier outburst is also reduced. However, he added that safety cannot be guaranteed with unpredictable natural disasters such as quake and global warming which can trigger the outburst. The project itself is risk reduction, not eradication, because 100% eradication will not be possible because we are fighting against nature. But it is some sort of a risk reduction, which means by reducing five meters of the level, we have drained out uh, about 17 million cubic meters of water, which is as much as the flood that we had in 1994. The mitigation works were carried out by the Department of Geology and Mines under the National Adaptation Program of Action with funds from the Least Developed Countries Fund and co-financing from the United Nations Development Program, Austrian Development Cooperation, WWF and the Royal Government of Bhutan. Compiled for Sherb Zangmo, Son of Unso, for PBS News. With the onset of the festive season, followed by winter, penciling police usually see more burglary and other crime cases during such seasons than in any time of the year. As a preventive measure, every year the police carry out door-to-door -door awareness campaigns on such crimes. Call it coincidence or effective campaigning, but burglary cases have seen a decline since the program was initiated two years ago. 86 burglary cases were recorded in 2009 against 43 in 2008. About seven cases were reported every month then. This increasing burglary rate demanded more proactive measures to curtail the situation. So in 2010, Finsoning police first carried out door-to-door -door crime awareness campaign in the town. Burglary rate was brought down to 51 cases in the same year. This year, the record shows only 28 cases till date. And the effort continues. 
This year also, they are visiting door-to-door -door explaining how safety tips and seeing whether people have installed doorknobs, peepholes or chains. This initiative received a warm response, but some houses are still without proper security. They said most burglaries happened by breaking through the door. The burglars use simple tools like metal rods and knives, which a door with proper locking system could resist. Meanwhile, the police are also finding it difficult to identify the culprits due to porous border and burglary complaints coming in late. Compiled for Sonam Wangdi, Tanin Finso, BBS News. The Royal Institute of Management will start two new master degree programs, one in 2013 and the other in 2014. The Institute says in preparation for the launch of the two new master's degree programs and also to expand the institutional network, a three-member delegation visited some of the reputed universities in Australia, Singapore and Thailand recently. The two new courses will be Master's in Business Administration and Master's in Supply Chain Management. Master's in Business Administration course will begin by next year. Lembo Doji Wangdi said they have signed a letter of intent with the Faculty of Business, Government and Law of University of Canberra. The delegation has signed Memorandum of Understanding with Management Development Institute of Singapore and Asian Institute of Technology in Bangkok. The delegation also finalized signing of MOU with the Civil Service College in Singapore. Lempo added that with signing of MOUs, it will further strengthen the capability of RIM in designing and delivering the programs. The areas of cooperation uh, with these universities are uh, broadly the same, but uh, of course we have a specific uh, programs with each of them. But uh, largely what we are trying to do is to take the, the programs of RIM to a higher level in terms of quality, uh, as well as broadening the portfolio of programs that we are offering. Royal Institute of Management will also start short executive management development programs. Currently, the institute offers nine different courses. There are two master's degree programs, three diploma courses and four postgraduate diploma courses. Sonam Hamu for BBS News. Solar electric fencing has proved to be a success in keeping wild animals away from fields. There are, however, still many villages where wild elephants continue to ravage crops. Lamchin Pugyok from Jomotsinka Dunkak in Samdub Zonka is one of them. Farmers say they want more solar fencing to keep away the elephants. The upper Langchinfu areas close to the Geok office are at peace. So is their crop. The paddy will be harvested any time this month. Villagers hope to reap a bumper harvest this year. Wild elephants that have been a menace in the past did not visit their fields this year. Thanks to the solar electric fencing provided by Nature Conservation Division earlier this year, Langchin Fugab said the electric fencing that stretches over 3.5 kilometers is benefiting about 100 households. Earlier, we had problems with elephants coming to the fields here in Langchin Fu. People could not sleep at night, but this year, after the electric fencing was installed, people could live in peace. As for the crop, we are expecting a great harvest. The solar fencing has benefited us a lot. But it is a different story for the people of Changsa. Changsa is about 15 minutes drive from Langchinfu. Villagers had wild elephants visiting their paddy field continuously in the last couple of days. The elephants had ravaged their rice fields. The grains have been eaten and the only paddy stalks are left. The elephants came at 11 o'clock. There were four of them. Shortly before them, two elephants came. And at four in the morning, another one came. They destroyed everything. It's painful. We have worked so hard. We don't know whether to cry or laugh. We try to chase away, but nothing works. Harka Badu Tamang's daughter cuts the leaf over rice stalks to be fed to the cattle. Villagers said they make fire 
beat empty tins and plates to scare the elephants away. They even pelt stones, but nothing works. So like other villages, they said they need solar fencing. The Cup has already requested the Nature Conservation Division for a solar fencing for Changsa village. Many chiefs do not have solar fencing. Elephants are a huge problem, especially in Jiangsa and Ruchika. Several acres of crop have been destroyed this year. There is a good news for Harkabadur and others. The Nature Conservation Division office in Thimpu says Jiangsa village will get solar electric fencing by end of this year. Compiled for Kinsang Yishe, this is King Awongmo for BBS News. Monks usually spend their lives in prayer and contemplation, but the monks of Tali Shedra in Zhemgang are different. What makes them different, you ask? They have taken up farming. They have been growing hazelnut in their campus. It is like any other day, but these monks do not confine their time chanting prayers and conducting religious ceremonies. They are out in the open trying out something different. Some 30 monks are growing hazelnut plants and turned their campus into a farm. We normally don't get much physical activity while conducting rituals, but this activity helps us stay mentally and physically fit. The plantation of hazelnut once established can produce heavily and consistently. There are always problems of lack of funds, and government and general public donate whatever they have. So to be self-sufficient, we started hazelnut plantation with help of agriculture officials and nearby villagers. The Shedra has about 1,000 hazelnut saplings in their campus this year, and come next season, they hope to grow more. Compiled for Pema Samdrup, Pema Suki for BBS News. Well, that's all we have for you in this week's edition of Bhutan This Week. Join us next week. Until then, this is Tenzin Rebgi saying bye-bye and have a great weekend.